Very interesting verse here. Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 says, When the Most High divided, not brought them together, divided, to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So how many boundaries would there be? Twelve. According to the number of the children of Israel? Twelve different tribes. Okay? Verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Did God pick one people? Mm -hmm. You say, well, it's the Aryans, the white Europeans. No, sorry. Um, it's the black Africans. Those are God's chosen people, right? No, I'm sorry. Sorry. I know who it is. It's the American patriots, right? That follow the Constitution? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. The Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is a lot of His inheritance. One nation. And God says, I'm going to deal with you exclusively and forget the rest. And that's the way it was for most of the time. Most of history, God dealt with the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel. Right now, anybody can get saved, sure. God's no respecter of persons. We're going to be looking at these verses as we continue. But after the rapture, it goes back to one nation again. You know, one nation under God. <laughs> It'll be truly one nation under God. And then he's going to be whipping them like crazy to get them back in line, to get them ready for that millennial kingdom when they'll get their land that God promised to Abraham. But you see, all this stuff is just shocking and horrible to a lot of people. And our modern politically correct system is gearing people up for this coming New World Order time period with the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to try to do the same thing that was done back there with Babel. He's going to say, we all need to get together. Let's eliminate our differences. So you see, this movement is so strong, it's so pervasive, that even Christians many times get suckered into this thing. And you start having problems when somebody says, when they make that distinction about their tongue or their people or their nation, their kindred, you know, and somebody says, I'm going to give you an example here. I am very happy to say that my ancestors are Germans. And they are. My ancestors are from Germany. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the thought enter your mind that I might be a white supremacist or perhaps even a Nazi? because of that statement I made. I've had people say that. You know, I say, my ancestors are from Germany, and they go, what are you, a Nazi or something? Where did that come from? That came from the pro programming, the, the conditioning, the, the brainwashing that is so pervasive right now in our culture. You're being told, if you talk about your kindred, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm a German, I'm proud to be a German and everybody else is inferior. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I respect the fact that I have a distinction, that my distinction, the thing that makes me different is my ancestors come from Germany. Does that make me better than other people? No, it makes me different. See, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing at all wrong with that. We should celebrate our differences, you know. I mean, out here in this forest right now, right now there are a lot of different trees. Right here, this is an elm tree, these little leaves here. Some of these real big trees that you can see around, you can't see too many of them, but some of the big trees here are tulip poplar. Um, over there's a little hickory tree. I mean, it, it, there's distinction out here. You say, oh, all the trees are the same. Well, <laughs> you're ignorant, okay? All these trees are not the same. And as a woodworker, I, you know, I would... I know the differences in these trees. I mean, there, there are differences with these different types of wood. Different woods have different qualities. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing when you celebrate differences, okay? It's not some kind of a horrible thing. I mean, you know, I don't want to go off on a big tangent here, but the fact is there are some woods that are rot resistant. There are other ones that will rot in a, in a year if you leave them outside, you know? You don't make certain things, and I mean, there's some that are good for furniture, some are not. Some are good for firewood, some are not. I mean, differences, all right? 
find out what kindred you are from. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? That, irritates me, this whole system. And people think that I'm teaching racial supremacy. I'm not. I'm teaching differences. That's all I'm saying. Respect the way that God made you. But, uh, you know, and, and of course, what's the underlying philosophy here? I wanted to say this. I just get sidetracked easily when, you know, talk about something like this. What's the underlying philosophy? The underlying philosophy goes right back to this thing of attacking the Jewish people. And they're made to feel bad because, you know, they're trying to, you know, God's given them a promise that they get land, and they're one people, one nation that God deals with. And you say, well, I don't see this distinction in the New Testament, Brian. I think that you're really grasping at straws here. Let's look about that. Romans chapter 11. Turn to Romans chapter 11. If you think that God doesn't have these distinctions for today, you're, again, not aware of what the Bible teaches. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Okay? I say then, hath God cast away His people? Remember what we just read there back in Deuteronomy? His people? Hath God cast away His people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, what a lot of the false teachers will try to do is they'll try to say that any time you see the word Jew in the New Testament in the terms of the Pauline epistles, it's always talking about spiritual Jews. You know, those that are born in as a spirit of adoption and stuff, you know, and we're all spiritual Jews and so whatever. That's not what Paul's talking about there. Paul is talking about his kindred. All right? Look here at Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. Okay, he says here, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the Spirit. It doesn't say Spirit, it says according to the flesh. You then... You think Paul would make a distinction based on his race, if you want to use the PC term? Mm -hmm. He certainly did. Verse 4, you say, well, who, are, who is this flesh? I mean, he's probably talking about Christians, right? Verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Do you realize what Paul just said there? He said, one nation, one people, one kindred, and they're the ones that have all the promises, they're the ones that have the covenants, and they are the ones that Christ came for. What a horrible racist thing to say. He didn't say who, you know, the whole world that Christ came for. He said, my people, my kindred, my brethren are the ones that Jesus Christ came for. So I can't believe that. I just can't believe that he would make such a racist statement saying, exalting his kindred above everybody else. Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 15 is this really true? I mean, Jesus wouldn't have taught this thing, would he? I mean, you know, I mean, Paul, you know, he was not, he was just the man, you know. Paul was capable of sinning, and he was. But certainly the sinless Son of God would never have said anything like this, right? Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 28. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan... Who were the Canaanites? The descendants of Ham, the African people. A woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. It's not very nice. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And he said, and he answered and said, Now look at this. 
I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Wow. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Ooh, boy. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Did Jesus say to her, Hey, I was just kidding about that. <laughs> I didn't mean to offend you. I mean, I didn't mean to say anything about your race. I mean, I, I don't want to get in trouble. You know, I don't want to be guilty of a hate crime or anything. Did he do anything like that? No. Why did he answer her prayer? Because she took her place. She said, truth, Lord. Hey, am I a Gentile dog? Truth, Lord. Oh, Brian, you know, aren't you a, an Israelite or something? Aren't you a Jew? You know, no, I'm not a Jew. I'm a Christian. And if it wasn't for the fact of Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay for the sins of man and, you know, the, the nation of Israel basically rejecting Jesus as their Messiah, I'd still be in trouble. I'd still be a heathen, you know, more than likely. But, you know, it's there in the Bible. And, and you know, the, the whole point I'm trying to make is that, you know, this, this whole modern day system has gotten us so far away from what the Bible actually teaches Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel. One nation. And this thing, this whole modern day system of put aside your differences and all this other stuff, let's all come together, that thing is so satanic. It is just evil. Completely evil. But let's see another example here. Matthew chapter 10. You say, well, that's just one instance there, Brian. I reject that, you know. That probably wasn't accurately translated or something, you know. Okay, let's look at another one then. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7 says, Then twelve, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hmm. What was the gospel that they were preaching? The kingdom of heaven. What was the kingdom of heaven? That Jesus Christ, their king, their promised Messiah, was there. If they would have accepted him, they could have had that land that was promised to Abraham. But they rejected their king. They crucified their king. So that time period was put off. Okay? But you see there, Jesus didn't say, hey, go preach to everybody. You know, we're all one. Uh. -uh. He said, Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Dealing with one people, one kindred. Hmm. You know, I get really concerned when I hear people saying about these wicked Jews and these satanic Jews that are over in Israel and they're so evil and they're so horrible and all this stuff. That's very, very, very serious. Okay? I'm going to show you why. Turn next in your Bible to John chapter 4. I don't think you can hear it right now, but it's just really lightly raining. It's one of the reasons why I picked to do this in the woods today, because uh, most of the raindrops aren't making it down to us here. But uh, we'll continue as long as we can here, as long as it doesn't get too bad. I'm trying to shield my Bible here. John chapter 4, verse 19. Okay, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. Now look at this. For salvation is of all people. Of the black Africans. Of the white Europeans. Of the patriot Americans. No, it says salvation is of the Jews. This book here is a Jewish book. That's why, interestingly, God waited till you had a king on the throne in England named James, which is a Jewish name. And some of the people go, that's ridiculous, that's absurd, that's just a coincidence. 
well, why don't you show me the word coincidence in the Bible, and then maybe I'll say it's absurd too. God has things planned out. And my God is able to work things out like this. So you call it a King James Bible. Hmm. And I understand, you know, it was originally called the authorized version. Nobody called it the King James at first and blah, blah, blah. I understand that. But, you know, it became known as that thing. And now you say King James, people know what that means. King James Version. So, just a little interesting thing there. But let's continue here. Look at uh, verse 23. Let's see where I'm reading here. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I showed that in another one of my sermons. I forget which one it was, but John Hagee said that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, he just did right there. John Hagee's a liar. You know, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Um, as it is written. By the way, it says there in Romans. But you see there, Jesus is actually starting to see now the Jews, the nation of Israel, is rejecting him as their king, and so he's giving prophecy for the future. The time's going to come when people don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. But you can worship God wherever you want. As long as you're worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. If you're not saved, don't bother worshiping the Lord. You're wasting your time. A lot of these people that go to these church buildings, you know, the Lutheran, Methodist, you know, Presbyterian, even a lot of the Baptists, you know, this all this denominational stuff, a lot of those people, they worship the Lord, but not in spirit and not in truth. And the fact is, if you're saved, if you have the Holy Spirit of God, you worship the Lord with the truth. And it doesn't matter where that is. In your living room, you know, and, you know, wherever. In the woods, in the fields, wherever. You can worship the Lord wherever you want. All right. But uh, let's continue here. Acts chapter 10. Now, when did this thing happen? When did it, you know, go from this thing of people having to go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, to worship God, to come to that holy temple there, you know, and, and you have the Levitical priesthood and all that, all the system of animal sacrifice and everything that was going on in the Gospels, by the way. Remember that Mary had to sacrifice a turtle dove, you know, when Jesus was born? So that system of sacrifice was still there. And that one guy comes to Jesus and he's sick and Jesus, you know, cures him and he says, go show thyself to the priest and offer the sacrifice commanded by Moses. So they were still under the law there before Jesus died on the cross. Now when did it go from that time where it was just the nation of Israel, where it was that chosen nation of God, where did it go from that to now anybody can be saved, any Gentile can be saved? Let's look about that. Acts chapter 10 verse 34. Acts chapter 10 verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Okay? And he had just been talking here to this guy, this Cornelius, which was a, um, a Gentile, basically. And, you know, the Lord had showed Peter this thing of the clean and unclean animals, you know, and likened it, basically, to us being unclean as Gentiles. But he says here, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Any nation now. Anybody can get saved. Verse 36, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from, Jerusalem, or from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And at, and we are witnesses of all things which we he both did, or did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Whom him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. 
And he commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness, uh, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall, perceive, or shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Remember, worshiping the, the Lord in spirit and in truth. The Holy Ghost there is the spirit. Verse 45, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For, then, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So you see there, here he is, Peter's with these Jews, and he's saying, you know, these people can worship God in spirit and in truth. And as he's preaching about this stuff, the Holy Ghost falls on these Gentile believers, and they start to speak with tongues. Now every reference in, your, in the book of Acts, every time somebody is speaking with tongues, there's always Jews present. Why? Because the sign gifts are given to confirm the word to the Jews. So you see that thing there again. But you see, here you have this early part there where now these Gentiles are starting to receive the Holy Ghost. They're starting to get saved. See, there's a transition going from where God is saying, my nation is Israel, and I'm dealing exclusively with Israel. And now all of a sudden, God's starting to swing over to the Gentiles. And he's starting to say, Whosoever will, let him come. You know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. You're starting to see that switch over from the nation of Israel now to anybody can get saved. But as I said earlier, that doesn't mean God is totally done with the nation of Israel. He isn't. He still has plans. We're just kind of in a little bit of an intermission here, if you will, with God's plans for that one people, that one nation, that one kindred. That's very important to get. Now look at chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 verses 1 through 3 says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, the Jews in other words, contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and did, didst eat with them. That sounds like a racial prejudice to me. Well, by our modern politically correct system, yeah, it was. Here you have these Jews, these Orthodox Jews, and they're saying, you ate with the uncircumcised, Peter? You were actually with these people? You went in and you talked to them? These Gentile dogs? And Peter's like, mm -hmm. yes, some things are changing. See, God is now allowing all men to be saved not just the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews, yes, but now all men can be saved. Hmm. Very interesting how the Lord would do a thing like that. Now, is there a difference between saved Jews and Gentiles today? Do we have to say, do I have to say I'm an uncircumcised Christian or I'm a Gentile Christian? Do we have to say that today? Turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Galatians 3, verse 28. Okay, it says here, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Huh. Did you know that you're, if you're saved right now, you are a Christian? And that that covenant, that Abrahamic covenant that was promised to the nation of Israel, you're actually born into that. You're born in by a spirit of adoption. You're now Abraham's seed. Hmm, that's very interesting, isn't it? And by the way, if you are born into that promise, that covenant, then that means that that covenant is still there. It's an everlasting covenant those Jews get that land. In spite of what the United Nations says, in spite of what our foreign policy here in America says, and the more we mess with the, the Jews and the more we tell them to give up more of that land, 
the more God is just going to crush this nation. You know, America's in big trouble. Whenever you have our government going against that people, they're going against God's people, His chosen race, if you will. Chosen nation, chosen kindred. All right. But see, if I say chosen kindred, most people go, huh, what, huh, you know? So I say race, you know, and I, I'm not going to use that as my normal term, but the point is, that way, that's why I titled the sermon this thing, so people know what I was talking about, because people have been so brainwashed away from what the Bible, Bible terminology. But uh, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Galatians 6 verse 14 says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Okay, what's, what's Paul talking about here? He's saying he's a Jew, and he's saying, But God forbid that I should glory in this thing of my flesh here. Look at uh, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Or you see that thing again of, of uh, you need to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay? So it doesn't, there's no benefit in as far as being a Christian today to saying that you're a Jewish Christian. Okay? If you're a Christian, you're a Christian. You don't have to say I'm a Messianic Jew or some other kind of a thing. Just say you're a Christian. Okay? If you're in Christ Jesus, then you're one. And isn't it kind of interesting because the thing that uh, people want, you know, they talk about racial equality, you know, and all this stuff, and uh, equality among the, you know, male and female. You can have it if you get saved, you know. And they say, yeah, but you see, we don't want it if we have to get saved. If, if, if unity means, you know, true unity can only come at salvation, then we don't want true unity. You know, it's kind of funny because man in his sin tries to get everything that God promises to a Christian, a mansion, you know, riches, gold, silver, precious stones, unity, you know, they all try to get it here on earth without Jesus Christ. That doesn't work. Uh, there is no unity without Jesus Christ. There is no salvation without Jesus Christ. There are no true riches that are eternal without Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. Go next to 1 John chapter 3. Now what about heaven? What about the our uh, kindred distinctions? You know, there are differences. There are differences in our culture. There are differences in our ways. And you know, that's not that's not racism or bigotry or anything else like this. It's reality. 1 John chapter 3, but what happens when we get to heaven? 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, who's the he there? Jesus. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man hath this hope in him that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So I believe and I teach that in the resurrection we're going to look like Jesus Christ. All right? We are all one in Christ Jesus. That's why the Bible says that there's neither Jew nor Greek. All right? That's what the Bible says. Now turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, says here, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice was as I, was, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Okay? Now look what happens there, verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Now, I've taught about this in other studies, but that's the rapture right there. Okay? You say, it was just John. Yes, I know that. But, you know, in type, it's giving a picture of what the rapture is going to be. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're called up to be with the Lord. You know, that's what's going on there. Verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. 
And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. What do these men look like? What was their skin color? What was their kindred? I don't know. Let's continue reading here. Jump down to verse 10 of chapter 4 there. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Why were we created? For God's pleasure. You know, things would be pretty boring if every tree out here was all the same. If all these trees had no unique characteristics. And even trees that are the same kind of tree, these tulip poplars here, uh, they're, most of these are be out of the field of view of the camera, but each one has its own unique qualities and characteristics. Some of these things are just tall and straight, probably, oh, I don't know, a good 60, 70 feet tall before you hit, hit any branches, you know? Um, other poplar trees I've seen have unique curves to them and things like that. You see, it's unique. And a woodworker come out, can come out here, a logger, and he can say, wow, boy, what a nice stand of timber. He can appreciate the forest because of the diversity there. And that's how the Lord looks down on us as mankind. He looks down and he says, look at all that diversity. That's wonderful. That person there is really good at music. This person here is really good at preaching. This person here is really good at writing. That person there can crochet well. That person there can paint well. That person there can do this. They can garden well. They can... Diversity. See? Difference. Distinction. But let's uh, go here to Revelation chapter 5. And we're going to see about the 24 elders again. Again, there in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 4, you didn't see anything about, you know, the collar of their skin. But how about here in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8? And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's how you know that these guys are Christians. They're not Old Testament Jews. Okay? And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Alright? Now let me just stop there for a minute. Now I've heard a lot of different ideas of who these 24 elders might be. And one of the more popular ones is, you have 12 and 12 equals 24. So what would the 12 be? The 12 would be the sons of Jacob, which made up the 12 tribes. Okay, so that'd be the first part of the 12. The other 12 would be the 12 apostles. Okay, Paul being the 12th there that replaced Judas Iscariot. Uh, but there's a problem there. You see, because they were of one kindred. They were all Jews. So they can't be the 12 apostles and the 12 sons of Jacob. Can't be. These are out of every kindred, tongue, people, nation. So you say, well, who are they? I don't know. I honestly do not know. I mean, there are some things about the Bible that are just a mystery, and they're going to remain a mystery. You don't have to understand everything in the Bible, you know, to be able to say that the Bible is accurate. You know, the just shall live by faith. There are some things you just aren't going to be able to explain. You know, who are the 24 elders? Well, we'll find out when we get there. But does it say that John looked at them and he could see different uh, characteristics according to their kindred? No, it doesn't say that. They themselves are saying that we were that they are redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, nation. But it doesn't say that they looked different from one another. Okay? But now look at verse 11. There, Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, 
saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now, those angels, the many angels round about the throne, I believe that that is a reference to the body of Christ. Okay? The 24 elders, God picks them out of the body of Christ. I don't know who, I don't know where, I don't know exactly how that's going to work. But there's many angels there. If you remember back in 1 John chapter 3, it said, you know, that we are, now are we the sons of God? Sons of God is a reference to angels back in the Old Testament. And there are angels that are going to fall in this future time period. They already have some that have fallen back in Genesis 6. Again, watch the angels uh, video about that. You know, angels, what are they? But the fact is, I believe that, these, that Christians are going to replace the angels that fell and the angels that will fall in Revelation chapter 12 in the future. A third of the angels that fall. And you see Revelation chapter 19, Jesus returning with his saints. And, you know, Enoch even prophesies about that in the book of Jude. But then in all their places, it talks about Jesus coming back with his angels at the second coming. So I believe that Christians are likened to angels. And how do they look? Well, I believe that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I believe we're going to look like Christ. So when you get up there to heaven, there's going to, not going to be any kind of racial distinction. We're not going to look like the kindreds that we are. You say, well then, all people will be like that from then on, right? No, not so. Turn to Revelation chapter 7. And Revelation chapter 7 is about saints that get saved during this time of Jacob's trouble that's coming. The seven year time period, most people call it the Great Tribulation. That's not actually a Bible term, the Great Tribulation. Um, it's actually called the time of Jacob's trouble because it's about Jacob, you know, Israel. But um, it's about the saints that get saved in that time period. And Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 8 is about the Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes that are sealed you know, and God protects them. But uh, look at verse 9, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now notice, it doesn't say that they are before the throne and they said that they are from all kindreds, tongues, people, nations. John beholds them and says all, that they look like all people, kindreds, tongues, nations. So these people that get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble, they come up to heaven and there's, they retain that kindred distinction that they have when they're down on the earth. All right? So it's different than the Christians. See? I mean, this stuff is, is really, really deep and, and everything. I realize that, but, you know, I can't, I mean, this could go in a whole other direction here, but the fact of the matter is, you know, there's a definite um, difference there between people that get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble and the body of Christ. The body of Christ goes up, they're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and they are angels. The time of Jacob's, tra time of Jacob's trouble, saints go up, and they retain that kindred distinction. You can look at them. John says, I beheld, and lo, you know, a great multitude of all, you know, uh, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. All right, and then it goes on to say that they wash their robes. We don't wash our robes. We are washed. All right, so again, there's distinctions there. There's differences there. But what about the millennium? Now this is interesting. Jeremiah chapter 30 verses 10 and 11 says, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return and be, shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So in other words, God is going to destroy all nations during the time of Jacob's trouble except for one nation. 
Well, that sounds like racism to me. You know? Racial supremacy, uh, you know, and stuff. Well, it's going to be of the Lord. The Lord's going to do that thing. And when that time comes, the Lord's going to say, okay, now to the nation of Israel, now you get your land that I promised to Abraham way back when. And see, I think that if the nation of Israel had stayed with the Lord and not sinned before the Lord, I think that they would have gotten that land that God promised to Abraham. But they sinned and they fell and they sinned and they fell and then they get a good king and then they get a bad king. And Read the Old Testament. It goes all the way through it. You know? And Jesus Christ comes down and He says, I'm here, I'm your king. And they say, kill him. You know? So again, that promised land is put off for a while. All right? You go through the church age, you come out at the, the end of it, the time of Jacob's trouble, God comes down and whips the nation of Israel another time, and then they get the land. Okay? And nobody's going to make them afraid from that point on. But now let's look at what happens in eternity. Revelation chapter 21. This last place we're going to turn to today. I feel almost like I really can't do this subject correctly because there's so many other points I could go over. Um, but it just would be so many hours in length. Um, but Revelation chapter 21, verse 24. Okay, this is after the millennial kingdom. It says here, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor un into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glo glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So in eternity, the national distinctions, I believe that were originally there after the flood, those national distinctions come back. And they're there for eternity. Now, if God wants just one mush, you know, just one mess, everybody's the same, everybody looks the same, and there's no distinctions and whatever else, then why would he do that? Going on and in, into eternity, he has the nations brought back. Even though at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, he just wipes out all those nations, I believe he brings them back. He brings them back so that there's that distinction again. So God can look down at each one of those unique peoples. Hmm. Very interesting. But man, in his sin, tries to make everything the same. And that's what you have to watch out for. That's why a lot of people get offended by the King James Bible, because the Bible teaches distinctions. The Bible teaches divisions. And says, be separate. Don't all come together. Be separate. Here's what man tries to teach. Number one, that women should look and act like men, and men and women, or men should act and look like women. They say, are you in touch with your feminine side? Well, sure, I talk to my wife, you know. <laughs> no, I meant you yourself personally. No, I don't have a feminine side. Sorry, I don't. That's up to my wife. She's the feminine part of, of our family, or, you know, our, us as a couple. I'm not going to be feminine. I'm not going to act effeminate. All right. Say, you know. Uh, and it's kind of funny, too, because another one of the modern PC things is they say you're secured in your masculinity if you're okay with sodomy. That is a bunch of nonsense. You know, hey, I'm okay with that sodomite over there. You know, if you want to do that, hey, that's cool. It's not for me, but, you know, it's cool for you, you know, whatever. Uh-uh, uh-uh, it's an abomination. Sodomy is an abomination. All right. Just the way it is. Well, you know, we should eliminate distinctions. You know, Men shouldn't have facial hair. I get that one too, you know. Women should have short hair. I've seen women with hair my length, you know, like that. Why? You know, as a man, I want to look like a man. I want to act like a man. I want to talk like a man. See? I don't want to look like a woman or anything else. And if you're a woman, you ought to try and look like a woman, you know. I mean, if you don't, what are you really telling the Lord? You're saying to the Lord, hey, you know, kind of made a mistake here. I want to look like a, a man. Bad. How about number two? All religions should be the same. 
we're all working our way to heaven. <laughs> no, you're not. You know, if you're working your way to something, you're going to hell. It's as simple as that. Number three, no distinctions among kindreds. Oh boy. You know, a lot of people get offended at that. I mean, look into it. You know, I mean, here, I'm in America, and it's like this whole movement of, of just, everybody just kind of blends all the cultures together, and it makes problems. You know, more and more I'm starting to study my ancestry and things and starting to go back, and you know, all your, your you know, genealogies and stuff, endless genealogies and things. No, that isn't what it's about. That was specifically written to the Jews, by the way, you know, those and things, but again, another issue. The fact of the matter is, you know, I'm happy the, the fact that God made me, you know, as a descendant of Germans. I can look back at that thing. I can study my culture. I can study my heritage. And that's not a sin. God wants distinction. And fourthly, the thing that a lot of people try to say is that God, or that no nation has the exclusive right to own land and force other people off of it. Now that's the big one right now. You see, all these people come down on the nation of Israel because Israel is saying, that's our land, you get out of here. And the Palestinians come along and they say, we have just as much right to this place as you do. And the real Jews, the ones that are truly understanding what's going on, say, no, you don't. You get out. See, that's so harsh and so horrible to, to say that there's one nation that has the rights to a piece of land and other people don't have it. But I, that's what the Bible teaches. There's the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? And God wants division. God wants separation. And when you bring everybody together and you bring all religions together and you say, let's not make distinctions between men and women, let's dress the same, let's look the same, let's act the same, and you're bringing everything together, you're out of God's will. And God's going to do things to separate that situation. And, you know, I get a lot of people mad at me and stuff and, and you know, sorry about that, but I'm not going to change what the Bible says. This book is a Jewish book. This wasn't written by my ancestors. And a lot of you, it wasn't written by your ancestors. Okay? This book is a Jewish book. This book has a Jewish Savior. This book has a future for the nation of Israel, not the nation of America. America is not God's chosen nation. Mm -mm. America did some things right in the past. I'll, I'll grant you that. You know, God bless this nation. I understand that. You go way back. Yeah. Our forefathers didn't come here to set up a wonderful new world order where everybody can be the same. No, there were distinctions. Um, the area which I grew up, there were a lot of areas that were named after German things. Why? Because there was a lot of German settlers here. Strasbourg, Heidelberg Township, Wummelsdorf, Schaeferstown, Kleinfeltersville. There's a lot of German type sounding places. Out in California, there's a lot of Spanish type sounding places. San Francisco. Uh, you know, places like that. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having ethnic foods and things that, that your family passes down through. Traditions that your family passes down through. As long as your traditions aren't, you know, going and killing people and shrinking their head or something like that and putting them on a stake or something. Well, you know, you need to abandon that as a Christian. But as long as your traditions and customs and things of your people, of your kindred, as long as they don't cause you to be sinning according to the Bible... Well, then practice them. Do them. You know? Respect the fact of who God made you to be. And don't fall for this modern politically correct system that makes you be ashamed of your kindred. That stuff is wrong. And, you know, I, I've personally done that thing for years and years and years, and it's only been a recent thing here. I listened first to Dr. Ruckman, and he talked about this, this thing, segregation versus integration. Very, very good sermon. And, you know, he says a lot of things that are politically incorrect. But you know what? I look it up in the Bible and it's right there. And it's never been about putting people down and saying, I'm superior to anybody out there. I'm not superior to any of you. Okay? That isn't it. I'm different. And many of you are different than me. Praise the Lord. These trees out here are different. Praise the Lord. Flowers are different. Birds are different. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of a boring world if we had all one kind of bird? 
all one kind of flower, all one kind of tree, all one kind of food? Is that really the kind of world we want to live in? No. But you see, Satan and the people that follow him want to get rid of those distinctions. You know? They want people to be sodomite. You know? You have a man that acts like a woman. And you have a woman that acts like a man. That's an abomination. Total abomination. So, I, I could go off on this thing all day, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to put this message together because there's been some questions. Some of the things I've said in the past, people have had some questions and they, they wonder if I'm a white supremacist or something. <laughs> I'm not a white supremacist, okay? I just celebrate the fact that I'm different than other people. Not better, just different. I don't want to be the same as other people. I don't want to take, you know, I've already lost so much of my culture, so much of my heritage, um, and I want to get some of that back. That's why my wife and I, we're, we're both German ancestry, and, and we're trying to study the language, we're trying to study the people. You know, if, if the TSA wasn't so rotten and crooked, you know, we'd probably even go over there just to go see the land of our ancestors, you know. But uh, I'm not going to fly with the way the airports are right now. Not going to happen. But the, the fact of the matter is, I believe from studying this issue that the Lord wants to see that distinction. The Lord wants to see not pride. He just wants to see that you honor the way He made you. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, we're still working on the other one, the second part of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism study. Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of things with that. Uh, different things we're finding out. And uh, so that thing will be coming out here soon. Um, and uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I just want to thank you, Lord. Um, I know you've always dealt with the nation of Israel, but I, I thank you, Heavenly Father, that that uh, you were able to, to die on the cross to, to save us and and now we have the ability to get saved and, and be heirs according to the promise there. And, and uh, Abraham's seed, Lord, I, I thank you for that. And I just, uh, I praise you, Lord, for salvation. And I pray for all those out there, Lord, that they would really seek the truth in this matter. And that they would uh, not be ashamed of your word and of what your word teaches. And I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure I've probably made some real good enemies with this sermon. But uh, brethren, you're just going to have to stand for the truth. That's, just, that's all I can say. Um, as things get worse and worse and worse in our country, around the world, uh, things are just, there's going to be more and more and more pressure on you as a, as a Bible-believing Christian to back away from the book. And the, the trend of the world is going to be away from the Bible and attacking the Bible, antagonistic against the Bible. And you're going to have to stand. It's not easy, but uh, it'll be worth it one day. So that's it. Thank you very much for watching.